Now, I, it seems to me that if a country you will not um, extradite someone uh, and a country will not cooperate in handing over someone who's been legitimately indicted, uh, that that's an acceptable, although least acceptable way to go about and do this. In other instances, countries have complied. Uh, I think we had Ramzi Yosef, who was uh, in Pakistan, who was complicit in the 1993, I think, Trade Center bombings, and Pakistan handed them over to us. It wasn't pursuant to extradition, but that's the, the method that uh, would be desirable. <coughs> I, I'm glad that's uh, surrendered. I can answer that one, and the answer is absolutely not. Um, uh, so, yeah, no, it would not be, it, it would be illegal. The only legal option would be to request extradition or to request consent by the host state to allow the U.S. to enter for those purposes. But unless consent was granted or extradition was awarded, it would be illegal to enter the country uh, using, uh, using military force in order to capture someone for those purposes. That is under international use of, use of state responsibility and also use of force. It's, a, it's an illegal intervention. It's an illegal, illegal intervention into another country. Right, so you, put, you put military force into another country, that is, that's a clear violation of the UN Charter. Other questions? Yes, Mrs. I Nader. I not only might deter the next president, but if you go through an impeachment process and it's televised, it becomes a grand public education program. And people will talk about it and have talked about it when we've had impeachment proceedings. Uh, from the Nixon one to the, uh, to the uh, Clinton one. And maybe if we did have such a public conversation to elevate us away from the details of the legal, we get to the ethical behavior and maybe begin to develop an ethical framework that might inform the legal. Do others who haven't spoken yet on the impeachment question want to want to say a word about their view about that as an alternative or as a way of sparking conversation? Well, I'll just say, I, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that I think this is an area where, uh, you know, we need greater uh, 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 transparency, I think, at least as a matter of policy. Uh, 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 stronger oversight would be uh, 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 appropriate here in the form of, of especially of congressional oversight. I, I, in, in, in my mind, I, I just I don't see a, a case for impeachment at all in in uh, 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 in the kind of policies that we've been been talking about. And I would just uh, uh, while I have the microphone, just on the issue of of technology proliferation, because uh, I was I was mentioning this earlier. I. Uh, I sense uh, I, I want to push back uh, against the idea that uh, uh, if the United States had kept this technology by U by which I mean armed UAVs uh, uh, in the bottle, we would not see proliferation. Uh, uh, this I mean sadly, uh, I, I, and I, I, uh, sadly, this is not that difficult a technology to develop an armed UAV. A very precise, sophisticated, long-range one is difficult, but an armed UAV is not that difficult to, uh, 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 to create. I, 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 and uh, uh, so I don't know, I, 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 I want to uh, push back against the idea that if we see a proliferation in armed UAVs, it's because the United States has caused that. I also want to push back against the idea that because we use armed UAVs, we've in a sense disabled ourselves from condemning uh, uh, what I would see as, and and what the U.S. government would view as patently illegal uses of of armed UAVs. Uh, uh, what I'd want to do, and this is why I think articulating more clearly the uh, the normative limits of what we're doing, where we can use force against whom, how, uh, is I think it sets us up better to uh, 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 to make that kind of strong condemnation. Uh, uh, it increases the, the legal, political, diplomatic costs to other states and non-state actors that might want to use these technologies for illegal ends or, uh, or in illegal ways. Great, thank you. Can I All just right. say something? What, just short, short of impeachment, um, the other day there was almost um, a determination that the president would be subpoenaed or the, the, the um, opinions of the Office of Legal Counsel 
on the, um, the justifications for these drone strikes would be subpoenaed. Um, and then Congress backed off uh, because there's been a slight trickle of, uh, of some of these opinions, in, uh, but only as to the targeting of Americans. Um, so one significant step that Congress could take to force a confrontation um, is, to, is to subpoena the legal opinions um, that, that are the justification for the, you know, the broader spectrum of the targeted killing program. Uh, I, see, I, I just want to add yeah. that in the, in the Nixon impeachment, one of the articles of impeachment against President Nixon was he flouted a congressional subpoena. Uh, I see that Mr. Nader would like to get a question in. Mr. Nader? Yes. Um, the discussion today comes out of a matrix of <clears throat> repeated violations <coughs> of the executive branch of our Constitution, statute, and international treaties. Just to give you the usual list, we have a problem of secret courts, secret law, secret prisons, criminal wars of aggression, torture, illegal surveillance, arrest without charges for indefinite imprisonment, and a whole variety of other uh, violations that have become chronic. We're not talking here with episodic uh, violations. All in the, in the sub-matrix of what Bruce Fine pointed out, which is president acting in secret as prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner. <clears throat> this, is, this is a constitutional crisis of gravity that towers above anything that went on in the 50s under Senator Joe McCarthy, who was not part of the executive branch and didn't have a military division at his disposal. So out of this matrix, what is astounding to some of us in Washington and there are exceptions, Professor Jonathan Turley, Professor David Cole, here and there around the country, is that the law schools, the law professors, the law deans, the law students, and the chronically irrelevant law journals and law reviews <laughs> are oblivious to what's going on. And last year, sent a letter to the president of the Harvard Law Review and said to this new president, President Obama was formerly president of the Harvard Law Review. You are the intellectual <coughs> focus at the Harvard Law School. Would you consider having a symposium entitled The Presidency and the Rule of Law, where President Obama is at the symposium, is questioned by a group of Harvard Law Review editors? The, the president of the Harvard Law Review refused to even answer the letter. When a reporter called up, he says, no comment. When the reporter said, does this mean no answer? He says, no answer. This is the future. This is supposedly the best and the brightest. What will it take for the law schools who should have that Paul Revere function and should be on the ramparts and should be exercising foresight and should be the sentinel the early responders to, to realizations of the decay of our legal system from constitutional to statutory to international treaty levels, what will it take to wake up the, these institutions? And if they don't wake up, you can be sure that one million practicing lawyers and dozens of state and local bar associations aren't going to wake up either. What will it take, short of a drone strike at a convention of constitutional law. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would certainly do it. <laughs> I will say is, so what I will say is that our students deserve a lot of credit um, for convening us today um, to raise these questions. And, and what I would also add, uh, what's striking to me and what's been interesting to me uh, on working on this issue um, and having written over the course of the last few years, what feels like op-ed after op-ed after op-ed, raising questions about the legal authority for the use of military force abroad and the lack of responsiveness. Um, so it's not, I think, that it isn't happening, although maybe not as much as you would hope. But what is striking is how when we write about these issues and raise these concerns, there, it seems to be met with deafening silence. Um, and 
In particular, what's striking to me, and I don't know if others want to comment on this, is we've, we've been focusing a lot, and rightly so, on the role of the executive here, right? The role in which the president has <coughs> taken an outsized uh, place in the decisions about when and how to use uh, uh, drones abroad. But what is extraordinarily striking is how quiet Congress has been uh, in the midst of all of this. And how when uh, again and again many of us raise concerns about this, write op-eds claiming uh, that the president does not have the authority to use military force in the way that he has been. Um, and I think almost everyone up here has, has written about that. Um, uh, it's striking that Congress seems to pay very little attention when it is Congress that is institutionally in the best place to do something about this. So, um, so it's also the case of the courts, uh, as they often do, have been reluctant to intervene in this area. The Alawaki case that you raised, the courts had an opportunity to intervene in that case and chose to, on the variety of, of various procedural reasons, not to hear a case raised by his father um, about putting him on the kill list, um, using a variety of different procedural doctrines that are available to the courts to avoid these issues. So what is interesting is not only that it's not, I think, entirely fair to say that, that people are not raising questions, but that those in the position to be able to do something about it seem not to be particularly listening. Um, and I would raise, a, I, would, I guess as our final question, ask if anybody wants to say a word about why it is, why it seems to be the case that the separation of pow powers, that the balance of, of authorities and these other branches don't seem to be working particularly well in this area. Yeah, just to give one example of how invertebrate Congress has become, uh, when there was an effort to approach the Congress to authorize the delegation of a decision to initiate aggressive war against Iraq, was presented to the members of Congress, they were angry. They said, oh, don't ask us to be accountable for invading Iraq. You do it on your own. That's how reluctant these people are. Now, with regard to the issue of, is there somebody you can write to? Congressman Walter Jones is one who has displayed unwavering courage. For that, he was rewarded by being expelled from the House Armed Services Committee by House Chairman uh, Speaker uh, Boehner. But I had drafted with Walter uh, H. Conrez three at least sets the standards of impeachable offenses that covers thing most of what you enumerated, Ralph. And write to Congressman Walter Jones of North Carolina if you're looking for an outlet, because he will do something. And he's asked hearings by Judiciary Committee Chairman Goodlett. It's true that there's not enough right now to push something forward, but part of it, he needs your support, and he's willing to carry the torch no matter what his political jeopardy. Matt, did you want to have a Well, word? yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, sometimes Congress is, is, uh, is accused of, of not being sufficiently in the game. And I, I, that's a, a, a criticism I've made as well. I, I, I do think that Congress hasn't exercised uh, uh, its powers nearly as, as seriously and thoroughly as it should in this, in this area. But I think also, uh, oftentimes, I hear that criticism that Congress hasn't acted from people who um, sort of tend to downplay what Congress actually has done. I mean, it's not as though Congress hasn't been, uh, 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 has not passed any legislation related to counterterrorism activity since uh, uh, the original uh, uh, September 2001 authorization of the use of military force. It may be, though, that many people in this room don't like the statutes that Congress has passed. I mean, the reality is that con if you do believe that Congress ought to be uh, 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 playing a role in uh, 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 setting the terms of whether, for example, we are engaged in an armed conflict or not. Congress not only said that we are and did so very expansively after 9-11, but has subsequently passed a number of, of uh, 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 statutes, including multiple military commissions acts under uh, 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 Congresses controlled by different branches with presidents of, uh, uh, or Congresses controlled by different parties with presidents of, uh, of different parties in, in power. Multiple, on multiple occasions with regard to military commissions, with regard to detainee treatment, Congress has taken the position that we remain engaged in an armed conflict with, uh, with Al-Qaeda and has uh, uh, tried 
try to push the president in uh, uh, in the direction of using military instruments as opposed to criminal justice instruments. Now, I happen to think a lot of those statutes were misguided, especially in uh, in trying to cut off the use of the criminal justice system, because I believe that in many cases it's the right approach and it should be an available tool. But I don't want to I, 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 I don't want to confuse congressional silence in this case for congressional decisions that some of us here may not agree with. I would hate for this to, to end without a recognition of the very distinct probability that if Congress does step up to the plate and, and you know, assert its responsibility, most of us in the room are going to be very unhappy with the results. So if you, you, know, if you like um, you know, balance of powers more than you care about you know, whether people are wrongfully killed, then you know, by all means, let's, you know, let's get out there and, um, and demand action from Congress. Um, if you care more ab about how the United States is exercising its, um, its lethal powers internationally, um, then I would say be careful what you wish for. So I'm told we have enough time to do a question or two more. So, uh, so we'll go ahead and take a couple of questions here and then here, uh, and, then, uh, and then I think we'll conclude. So, yes. I just uh, would like to make, my, my name is Bill Curry. I'm a driver. I'd like to uh, just make uh, two quick points. And the first of which is, you know, if, if you want the Congress to do something, the best way, uh, well, I'm saying, if you want Congress not to do something, the best way is to put it in the Constitution that they must uh, uh, declare war, approve judges, uh, and the handful of specific instructions they have they're not following these days. And I think that much of what Mr. Waxman mm -hmm. yeah, alludes to in terms of these statutes, in their practical effect, it's more like the sense of the House resolution. Uh, the language isn't precatory, but it might as well be. Uh, in, I think that one of the great mistakes of progressive-minded people on a variety of issues is that we are all like Obama, having quiet discussions with the Congress rather than trying to marshal public opinion in a larger way. In a previous lifetime, I was a political director of the nuclear freeze movement. And it was just about six months between the time no one thought of the idea to the time that 80% of the people were for it. Uh, in a weekend last year, the entire country changed its focus, uh, changed its axis on immigration and gay marriage so that we get following the election. Uh, but so I, I the, the, the need for there to be a grassroots movement, the public, only the public can reason with these people. It's not a one-on-one -on -one deal. And the second thing I just want to say is that the, the, the chair of the, the, the wonderful moderator has done, uh, was the only person to use two words that I really liked, which were United Nations. And, um, <laughs> In another previous lifetime, I worked in Central America, and all the governments that I found there, I thought were grisly, horrific murderers and bullies, except for Costa Rica. And except whenever they got together in the Contadora process, they always did something admirable. Like whenever they were together and in public. And you can look around the world, and it's a principle that repeats itself over and over. Um, the, there may have been a time, the world needs a policeman. And there was a time after World War II that we were the only ones who could afford to do the job. And whether we did it well or on whatever motivation, in fact, it's debatable. But we're past that. And the fact that almost no one in either party, that would be only the Democratic Party you expected from, can rise up and say that whether it's, uh, whether it's cruise missiles or smart bombs or, 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 or drones or, or shock and awe, uh, knocking off 100,000 people, there's, there's there's no way we can continue doing this. We have to move to uh, an era of multilateral resolution of, of international conflict. And every time you know, a, 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 some extremist talks about blue-helmeted UN soldiers, the entire reform community shuts up. And uh, there is no way out here. This is not about which technology. This is, this is about the end of a much bigger road. And I would just encourage everyone on the panel who, who, who gets that to make sure that every time you speak about it, you talk about the larger system. It'd be great to have the FISA courts back. It'd be great to have something like that doing the due process. At least, you, you know, you don't give notice to people you're going to bomb, but you at least have some due process on picking them out. But 
the, the, the whole thing's broken. Uh, and, uh, and this conversation, I think, should always be in that context. That's very helpful. Anyone want to? And particularly to this idea of a FISA court-like process, which is definitely one of the alternatives that's on the table as a way to try and address this, mm -hmm. right? As, a, as, a, as one way to try and to try and uh, to rein in this process. Yeah, yeah, I want to say something about that. I think there's a, a, a huge difference between ex, uh, ex ante and ex post um, judicial review. Um, to to have a um, a so-called judicial process to determine who may be targeted um, that's not even going to be a judicial process that may be a, that you know that may be people with black robes on uh, but to call that judicial I think I think would be a mistake um, it would necessarily be done in secret it would in fact be essentially um, usurping an executive function and in doing so taking the responsibility off of off of the executive um, and, and it could very well, like the FISA court, simply become a, a rubber stamp mechanism that diffuses responsibility for, for killing people um, in, in a very unfortunate way. On the other hand, um, an ex ante process, which this administration has um, you know, very expertly prevented from happening uh, th through, um, through the, the promulgation and, and pressing a number of um, defensive mechanisms like protection of state secrets, um, and, and political question doctrine, et cetera. Um, those are the kinds of things that um, under what should be applicable international human rights law, namely saying that uh, people who are victims of human rights violations are, are, are required to be afforded a, a remedy. Um, that is an area in, in which I, I think um, we who are pressing for accountability and process in relationship uh, to government-sanctioned extrajudicial killing um, should be pressing more. As far as the United Nations is, is concerned, the UN, uh, a lot of people don't know this, has an extensive um, you know, counterterrorism uh, policy. It's got pillars, it's got um, counterterrorism executive director, it's got the counterterrorism implementation task force, um, but one of the problems with all of these mechanisms is that um, many countries, um, while they might um, hew to different standards than the United States does and may privately object to what the United States does, um, in fact, there are very few countries who will come out publicly and, and support the U.S. targeted killing program, um, neither will they stand up to the United States. Um, and there's a fair degree of hypocrisy, I think, particularly among Europeans um, who have their own standards and, and may object to what the United States is doing, but are privately um, just as happy for the United States to be running interference on, on all of these issues and taking the heat. And Matt wanted to get a word in. Yeah, I was just going to uh, uh, say, well, I, I, I don't agree with uh, uh, all of his remarks on this. I think uh, I, Gabor raises a, a very, very important point, which is uh, uh, that getting other branches of government in, into the game does not necessarily result in stronger checks, that those other branches can actually be empowering, especially if they end up green lighting or authorizing uh, uh, very broad executive powers. In that regard, I, 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 I do hope that, and what I would like to see, and, and when, I, when I encourage Congress to get, in, in, get further in the game, here's what I would like to see out of that congressional process, which is in thinking about legislation to regulate counterterrorism authorities going forward. I think there are a number of important lessons from the last decade and more now um, that should be worked into any uh, 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 new legislation that might follow. I think one, one would be uh, uh, substantive limits on the use of lethal force, for example, especially substantive li limits uh, 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 that uh, uh, come from the law of armed conflict, uh, because I think the United States has not been nearly as clear on this in its state practice, uh, uh, in the way that it explains its practice as compliant, as, as necessarily compliant with, in all cases, with the law of armed conflict. I, I, I would like to see in any new legislation uh, 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 Congress binding itself to some continuous uh, uh, and intensive scrutiny of the executive branch's activities. And I think it's important that uh, I, I, uh, any new authorities not be open-ended and indefinite, that they have to be imposed with some strict 
time limits, uh, 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 some, or per perhaps uh, some sort of sunset provision to avoid a situation that we we have with the AUMF, where once it gets turned on, uh, uh, it's very very difficult legally or politically ever to turn it off or to see it it, it uh, uh, reach some sort of clear endpoint. The FISA programs um, involves uh, building off the requirement that the judiciary approve wiretaps in domestic cases. The FISA program that's been around for 30-some years has the judiciary involved in whether or not you can use electronic surveillance to uh, surveil potential spies on behalf of foreign governments, now terrorists or otherwise. I don't know how that's a usurpation of executive power. That's what we've done with warrants from the outset. You know, the executive needs a judicial warrant ordinarily to search your home. Uh, now, with regard to this, the approach that I take, that this is a criminal law enforcement function, has the grand jury as the surrogate of what you're saying is the judicial check. Because with an out indictment, you can't go after and try to capture someone. Now, it may create the problem of international law while well, we're going into some uncooperative country. But is it, compared to the war paradigm, which has us going into countries without their consent, consent all the time, it's the least, best, all, the least worst alternative is all I can say. All right. I promised to get to this question here. Yes. You've been very patient. Can you um, introduce yourself? Yes. My name is Stephen Redeker. I run a not-for-profit here in New Haven, which works with, we work with Yale students and faculty. Uh, to, in, in response to you, Mr. Nader, to, uh, to encourage them to be more proactive in uh, dealing with issues such as this one, many issues, and uh, in, in perhaps in any other law school in the country. And these students are truly, truly, uh, their heart is into it. Uh, they have a lot of, however, they have a lot of academic demands as well. So it's hard, it's hard to get them involved in every single issue, but they are very involved. Um, so I, I, I applaud the law school for that. My question to the panel is this. Um, you talk about um, this whole issue of drones, and I think with all due respect that it's gone the way our society is structured now, and my working with students and faculty, not only at the law school here, but in, in students all over the world, it's beyond talking, just talking about things. It's beyond your coming here and, and telling us and giving us your opinions, which I think is important, very important. But I think you have to, all in all honesty, go a step further. I think it's up to you to, to organize some vehicle so that to get, <coughs> law, to get students here involved, rather than just coming and talking to say, look, we have organizations, we have a vehicle in which you can participate. Help us, you could say. Help us to deal with this problem. And before coming, maybe discuss with the faculty like uh, Professor Hathaway, how can, we, how can we track students? How can we appeal students to help us deal with this problem? Not just to come here and talk and go away. Because that <coughs> is wonderful and students will walk away being very much more informed, but then what? What happens? And it's up to you as leaders to, to, to engage, to galvanize this group of very talented individuals to go one step further, whatever that step is. And I challenge you to that. And I ask you, how would you do that? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, not my... Uh, the idea that, uh, that, that, that we come and, and sort of sit on panels and, and talk about it in abstract theory, but then don't do anything about it or encourage our students to, I think is just wrong. And so I want to push back against that. I mean, I know, because I know for, from what, what I do at Columbia and what, what I know that Professor Hathaway does here is we actually have a lot of activities in the classroom and outside the classroom where we do mobilize students to work on exactly these issues and to work with uh, I, I, various branches of government, to work with international organizations 
organizations, to work with NGOs, to be part of the political process and the legal process to actually deal with them. Now, I, I, I should say these are also pluralistic communities, and so uh, I, I, it's, it's often the case that uh, uh, there is a multitude of, of views as to what the answer is, and I'm not going to dictate to my students what, what I think the answer should be, and I don't, I don't hear you calling on, uh, uh, on us to do that either, but I would also say, for example, in, in response to, uh, I, 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 uh, to Mr. Nader's point from earlier, I don't think it's that law schools and law school, not just the professors, but that the students are, are silent on these issues and not mobilized to, to participate actively in the political debates. I think they're they're, they're participating uh, I, 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 in some serious ways, but in a variety of different directions. And and I think actually, I, I, it, for, speaking for my own experience with my students, actually uh, some uh, are quite opposed to the status quo, some are quite supportive of it. Uh, uh, and I think that's actually a good thing. We have a, a, a pretty serious and robust uh, 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 debate at Columbia, and, and I like the way that we're training the next generation of leaders in this area. Well, I, I mean, so, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, and I mean, I spend a lot of time coming here. And, and by the way, I mean, I spend a lot of time coming here to assist in, uh, uh, in, in, in the various training programs here and at other law schools. And by the way, I, I try generally to do it without making, in, 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 in my view, uh, uh, sort of discriminating based on their point of view. I want to, I, I mean, I have my, my views about, uh, about where policy should go, but I like to come and talk to, uh, student organizations at my own home institution and at other institutions from a variety of different perspectives because I learn a lot from it and I hope that I can inform their thinking, not just not just thinking in the abstract, not just so they can write a, a law review article or a law review note, but they can they can actually go out and participate in serious ways in the in, in, in the policy making process. Yeah, I was going to say you you probably have quite a bit to say about this. So. You know, my line of work is clinical law, so we're involved in, in practice, and I won't get into the things we're doing, but sort of the report and the work that we've done on uh, drone strikes and the consequences in, in Pakistan and, and elsewhere, but primarily in Pakistan, trying to bring into a U.S. debate, which generally U.S. debates tend to be uh, terribly ethnocentric, and we all use the first-person plural to speak of the government, uh, even though not all of us in this room uh, might see themselves as engaged in the collective first person about the U.S. government. Uh, but that's an aside. The bigger point is, I think there are a lot of people in law schools engaged in different ways. I think what the problem is, uh, if, if you identify it as a problem, has to do with where that energy is located and what students think that their engagement ought to be and what the institutions of law schools think that the, the student engagement ought to be. And I, I think there, you know, unfortunately, uh, with all due respect, the, the, I think that there's a, an excessive deference to authority on the part of law students, and I'm not speaking about Yale law students who may be... I think we should use a little more deference to authority. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe at Yale. We get too much of it at Stanford. Uh, I think there's an excessive deference to authority an excessive uh, belief in the goodness and righteousness and virtuousness uh, of authorities uh, in this country. And, uh, and I think that there's uh, an excessive interest on the part of students in uh, doing well rather than doing good. And I know that sounds uh, brutal, and, uh, and, I, and I don't purport to say my generation, my generation was in the 60s and now, and the me generation, God knows what we did, probably not that much. So I'm not saying, I don't mean to say, you know, we were better. I don't want to make any comparative statement, and I don't want to sound as though I'm being critical, but I think one of the things that we really have to grapple with is the fact that students at Yale today, students anywhere in universities in the United States today are a post 9-11 generation. And all of the social construction of what happened in 9-11 and what it means for us and how much uh, liberty we need to cede to ensure our security and our aversion to risk, et cetera, et cetera, all of that is part of the norm and the only norm that people who are 20-something in this country know. And people who are older, 
uh, at least have a, a, a political consciousness point of reference from what was life like before 9-11. And I've seen this in my uh, time in academia, which is a little over a decade. I've seen a shift uh, on a continuum between liberty and security towards greater security, greater deference to authority, greater ex uh, willingness to accept that what we're being told is true, even if the figures tell you otherwise. Uh, and I think that's that's a real problem, and I'm not sure how to address it. I think the response has to take place at many levels. It has to take place in terms of what we as faculty are, are teaching students, what we expose students to, what they read. I find it gives students a lot of uh, readings that they would not otherwise be exposed to in law school, uh, that they find uh, jarring. Uh, I think it has to do with a, a student organization and, and, and a rethinking of uh, the, the actual balance of, 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 of power in this country. And then finally, let me just say, so I don't want to be mischaracterized as having said, because I don't believe this, that the law is, uh, is not serving us and therefore we need new treaties. And I, 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 sort of, uh, I think there have been some comments that suggest that I may have uh, defended that position, that I think we need to have a new, new forms of legislation. And what I, I think the law is valuable up to a certain point. I think there are uh, limits on the law. I think one of the things that happens in law school is that we, unfortunately, as lawyers, adopt law and existing legal frameworks as uh, blinders and as constraints, as opposed to a, a map of, of, a, of, of, an, of, of an existing uh, uh, physical structure in front of us. It might be a good physical structure, it might be a bad physical structure. If it's a good physical structure, we work with it to make it as good as possible. If it's a bad physical structure, while we're sustaining the structure, we're looking to improve it. And in many other areas, we don't question the need to, oh, we need some other kind of legislative engagement or, or constraint. Uh, you know, if you look at sort of issues that, on which I think there has been some movement in this country in recent years in a more progressive direction, uh, things like marriage equality and immigration, you know, people are willing to say, let's work within the law to accept we can, make the arguments we can before the Supreme Court, et cetera. But if we need to engage a grassroots movement where people are changing norms and practices, we'll do that. We'll write new, uh, try and draft new immigration legislation. And the final comment that I would make is that I think as important as law is, and we are in a law school, and I am a law professor, I get that, uh, we, we have to, on some of these issues, and I think Bruce has made this point, we have to look at what's ethical and what's moral. Do we want to be a nation that believes that it should uh, truck or, in, or countenance no risk and preemptively kill many potential threats, incurring the wrath and the hatred of people in, in affected communities? Or do we think we should be doing something different with our foreign policy? That's a decision that we make, which can be framed in law or not framed in law but which is driven or should be driven by ethical and moral concerns. So the plea that I would make is on these issues and other tangential or directly related issues, to not think of the law as something that cannot be questioned, modified, or, or, or uh, restructured, and that what should ultimately guide us, even if we're lawyers, is our belief system and our sense of justice. And most of this, I've gone through all the law, and I run, into, uh, I run into brick walls at points where I have to recognize, yes, under existing law, if someone is preparing a warhead in North Reserve Sand, which they're probably not, but if they are, then under the preemptive doctrine or self-defense, et cetera, then this can be done. Okay, I, we can, I can work within the constraints of law. I understand that. But what I, what I recognize is that, and this, I think, one of the things that happens in law school, since we're on the topic of law school, is we move away from our visceral and ethical and moral frameworks and seem to passively accept that we should uh, you know, uh, search, replace, and delete existing concepts and uh, superimpose legal concepts and follow those. And we shouldn't. And we shouldn't. Go to your gut and ask yourself, does this feel right to you? And if it doesn't, you want to do something to, to, to push back against it in general. So, uh, last question from Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. I also was a supporter of Obama, and I remain a supporter of Obama. The question I have is, what can he do other than be impeached? Assuming that he, in fact, feels uncomfortable about standing up, which I don't believe. I, I think he's squeezed in 
question of kind of what what positively can we do going forward to to um, address these issues and what in particular can Obama do uh, to uh, try and rein in the program assuming that that is what he wishes to do aside from being impeached I think it's a it's an important question and, and one that deserves <coughs> really serious consideration so uh, yes The level of debate here has been too high, so I'm, I don't know if my question will be um, will reach that level. But I just wanted to, I wanted to um, ask a question about accountability. So I'm in an excellent class right now about the Iraq War, taught by a brilliant professor with nine other American students. And on our first day, we were just discussing about any possible accountability for the war. And all nine of them thought it was preposterous that any U.S. official would appear before a criminal court to answer for any charges. So just in the future, or do you, do you foresee any scenario where there will be any accountability about drone strikes from at any level of U.S. officials? As a matter of, as, as a matter of international criminal law yes. is the question. So, is there, so the question there is, is there a possibility that U.S. officials held to account in international criminal law? As so many other leaders from so many other countries. It seems like if you can do it, you will. And because other countries can do it, they, they will not or they aren't allowed to. Yeah. Okay, so um, Gabor, I think, has a question, uh, an answer to that. And also, uh, uh, feel free to yeah. respond to Gus's question as well. Um, the only reasonably predictable extent of accountability for Americans that are committing war crimes is that. Um, they may not be able to travel to certain countries. Um, and another, perhaps another corollary of that is if they make the mistake of traveling to certain countries, um, they could end up being prosecuted. Um, but I think that's an unlikely scenario. As far as what o Obama could do, um, you know, when Lindsey Graham gets on television and, and says that the, that the Boston Marathon attack is, is evidence of this administration's failure, uh, failed counterterrorism policies and weaknesses, what Obama could do is very simply get on television himself and tell Lindsey Graham to shut the hell up. Um, and, and to do it in a way that, um, that expresses a forceful statement of American values and, and what Americans can and cannot reasonably expect from their government and what security Americans can and cannot reasonably expect from their world um, and, and to talk honestly about the necessary um, compromises that need to be made in order for liberty to, pre be, to be protected in, in an unsafe world. Um, this is the kind of thing that Obama has for one reason or other, whether, whether it's because he doesn't believe what I just said or because he has you know, other priorities, I don't know. Um, but that is what he could do in order to try to shift the, the debate at perhaps considerable political risk to himself. Um, but that's what leadership, I think, would demand. Other responses? Uh, one, he can desist, refrain from, he can refrain from using predator drones until there's legal authority that satisfies the Constitution. No one's compelling him to direct people to press the button. Secondly, uh, he can uh, veto legislation rather than sign it that results in what uh, Gvor said is augmenting uh, in violation of the Constitution additional militarization of civilian law enforcement. Uh, he doesn't even issue signing statements like presidents are wont to do to suggest these are 
unconstitutional, at least in part. Uh, those are, in my judgment, the most important things he could do other than to make clear to the Congress and the American people that he has no unilateral authority to initiate war against Iran, North Korea, Yemen or otherwise, unless there's an actual or imminent attack. Uh, so he would reassure them it's not going to be his unilateral decision. No one forces a president to go to war without authorization from Congress. Any other closing remarks? All right. Well, let me say thank you to our students for joining us together. Thank you to all of you, and thank you most of all to our panelists here today.